Hey, Fringe listeners, exciting news alert. The Talent Talks podcast just hit the People Forward Network, and here's one of our favorite episodes. I love the energy and takeaways gained from this show. I hope you enjoy it so much that you follow the show. Talent Talks coming right up. Well, welcome back to Talent Talks. I'm Jonathan Reynolds, your host, and I'm sitting here with a fascinating guest today um, who is, well, his name's Kayla Spitless. Good to have you here. Thanks, Jonathan. Good to be here. Uh, And you hail from where? Right now I'm in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, Where are you originally from? Originally from central Wisconsin, so Watoma, small little town. Ah, nice, Mm -hmm. nice. Um, So uh, in this... Uh, the last few podcasts we've been talking all well, talking about everything to do with the people, humans, how we interact, how we mm-hmm. how we inspire one another, how we grow, how we how we do what we do in business. I think b- being in business is an absolute privilege. Um, I think it's a privilege to be in the world of uh, making profit uh, for good. I just think it's a huge opportunity to do good in the world, mm-hmm. um, which is big big heart behind kind of why Titus exists. And we work with loads of other small, mid sized and large companies around people strategy, helping them with their how to hire people, how to retain people, how to engage people. And I recently bumped into you, and you started talking to me about this topic that you've been on a just traveling all over the country, mm-hmm. speaking on and working with training leadership teams. Tell us about this topic. Yeah, so I've been speaking mostly on burnout is what uh, people are bringing me in for. Um, And that can be, uh, I guess, multifaceted in the sense of burnout can lead to less productivity or uh, high turnover. So those are kind of really the main reasons people bring me in is, okay, how can we optimize our people so that they're performing at their best and so that they're not leaving our company? Yeah. Where did this come from? Like, how did you get into this? Yeah, I mean, even looking back at my own story, uh, you know, started in sales maybe many years ago now, but early on in my career, I was selling life insurance for a small season. That's an immediate burnout. (laughs) Well, well, it was for me. I mean, I was, you know, just hustler, grinder, um, outworking everybody else. I wasn't necessarily the best salesperson, but um, I had one week where I sold 80 policies and that was one-to-one face-to-face. So I did about 100 meetings uh, that week. And um, yeah, I'd start at 5 a.m. where I was actually starting my meetings at 5 a.m. and then all the way till 1 a.m. the next morning. And uh, at the end of the week, I can picture I was sitting in my office. Is this, I mean, literally, you're, you're being no exaggeration. No, no. I know people think of, they think of the math on that and they're like, I don't actually even know how that's possible, but I was scheduling really short, uh, short meetings with people and basically like, Hey, buy this policy. You're about to die quickly. Sign this. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I can picture sitting in my office, uh, CEO of the company called me up and, uh, he said, Hey, Caleb, you just won this major award with the company. And uh, we're going to fly you and your wife out. Uh, you're going to have the fanciest dinner of your life. And we're going to talk about your future within the company. And I said, hey, that's fantastic. I appreciate that. But uh, I'm quitting. And he was like, what the heck? Like, you made 15K this week. Last year you were making, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it was in a year, you know. Yeah. So he was like, how is it that you're quitting after making all this money? I just don't get it. And uh, my answer was, man, I just feel burnt out. Like my relationship doesn't feel like, you know, my relationship with my wife doesn't feel like it's in the right place. My health doesn't feel like it's in the right place. I was just so tired. Uh, I can picture like driving home, like slapping myself in the face. My eyes were twitching. I just got to this place where I was like, all right, pump the brakes on everything. I got to stop and, and reevaluate my life. And from there, I've really tried to rebuild my life in such a way that I'm, I want to function at my best all the time, but I want to do that in a way that's sustainable. And uh, I found out that what worked for me is hopefully working for other people. And so people started asking me to come speak. And now that's essentially what I'm doing full time is traveling, speaking all over the country. Wow. Okay. So when you, what, what type of, um, when you showed up and speaking, um, keynotes and things like that, uh, workshops that you're training on, um, what are some of the things that you're resonating so well with the the audience and people who are listening? Well, I think the first thing that um, I see within organizations is we love talking about competency, right? So we love if if we have you know a salesperson and we say, how do we make this person a better salesperson? We might say, okay, how are you handling objections? What's your prospecting look like? We might tr- start to train the competency side of things. 
Um, but for example, last night I was here in Chicago speaking to a group uh, that does auto collision. And so I said, hey, tell me what are the top three reasons that people get in car crashes? And they said, distracted driving, um, they're drowsy when they're driving, or they're on some kind of substance. Or maybe a fourth one would be road rage. Well, none of those things have to do with competency. You know, rarely when someone gets in a car accident, they don't say, I just didn't know the stop sign meant that I should stop there. You know, it's like we don't need to teach people how to be better drivers. We need to teach people how to show up in a right state. And so, you know, your salesperson could be the, a 9 out of 10 salesperson. But if they show up on Monday morning hungover, overtired, just got in a fight with their spouse, just found out that their kid is sick, they have a lot of issues going on that's going to affect their performance. And so... Usually when I'm sitting with leaders, a lot of times people think uh, workplace performance is static. So again, you're a nine out of 10 leader. That's what it looks like on a regular basis. But the data would show that that fluctuates regularly, that if we surveyed your people, they would say, well, this week, Jonathan was a three out of 10 leader because he had some stuff going on at home and he was a little bit more snappy and a little less inspiring. So I wanted to look at, okay, what are the levers that we can kind of adjust to make sure that our people are not just know how to do their job well, but are showing up on a regular basis and actually executing and getting results. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, you're, you're putting a different, uh, different spin on some of these things that we, well, we often talk about creating high performing teams, yep. finding high performers, things like that. But I also do acknowledge um, that we're in the people business mm -hmm. and there isn't a science to hiring or in science to engagement or science to retaining people. Yeah. Because, because I mean, you showed up here today, you left a family, you got kids, right? Yeah. Um, young kids. Yeah. And I would imagine this morning when you left the house, maybe there was some drama in my house this morning. I woke up to four piles of dog vomit. <laughs> so right before about to go into podcast mode mm -hmm. and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, does that affect my psyche? Does it affect the way I show up? Yeah. It has an impact, you know, um, the entire week, the, these things affect what's going on in my life today is very different from what was going on in my life 90 days ago or a year ago. And so we do these, you know, the ebbs and flows and ups and downs. And we don't we don't really look at that a lot when it comes to managing and engaging people a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, very rarely do we acknowledge that life outside of work affects them. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't really take into consideration on that. So, um, how do I mean, how, what are some of the things that you actually put into place that help people like figure these things out? Like what, how do companies, what do they do when they hear you talk? Yeah. So I, you know, listened to countless podcasts. I read so many books on this issue. I had, I don't know how many business owners I interviewed. I mean, countless, probably over a hundred business yeah. owners. Um, basically anything I do in life, I'm pretty all in, you know? So and what I found is burnout's a pretty complicated issue, but I could kind of categorize uh, the burnout issues into three silos where I said, okay, here's basically, in my opinion, I could be wrong. You could uh, share some things with me that maybe I'm missing. But I said, it seems like there's basically three things, at least within the workplace, uh, that would cause burnout for people. And those three things would be essentially too much pain, not enough pleasure, and not enough rest. So what I mean by that is, too many stressors. So someone could get burnt out because their coworker is obnoxious, they're a bad apple, and that is the stressor that is driving them into the ground. Um, the other one could be not enough enjoyment in their work. They're not connected to the mission. They don't feel like what they're doing matters. The payoff isn't enough for them. So they would say, yeah, my workplace isn't stressful, but I'm just bored. I'm just staring at the clock all day. Yeah. And then the third one, even if those two are in place, you have to rest. I believe rest is a standalone issue. Um, and I've done a three-hour workshop just on rest alone. Um, and I think the data on rest uh, in any industry would show that, uh, for example, nurses that work 12-hour shifts would make three, time more, three times more mistakes than nurses that work an eight-hour shift. Most truck driving accidents happen after they've been driving for nine hours. And so there is actually trackable data where we can say, here's how much somebody's working in their work week, and here's where we start to see the performance drop-offs. I love stats. Yeah. Just keep spitting them out. What else? What else? What else? <laughs> um, uh, through, uh, through somebody's day, if somebody's working, they say, I work a 60-hour work week. What, what about uh, capacity? Like some people can do more than others, right? Yeah. 
Yep. Like, like some people are like, oh, I can only do it. Oh, that was the, the negativity coming through. Oh, I can only work a 37 <laughs> hour work week. Yeah. Um, well, somebody says, listen, my 100% yeah. so that I can give my 100% at work so that I can give my time to my kids or my, anything, my community. Yep. So that I can be around the, those I love. Or so I can read a book and get refreshed. Mm-hmm. Um, here's my 100%. How do we value somebody else's 100%, which is, you know, a third bigger? Well, there's certainly different capacities. You know, if I told somebody, run as fast as you can for as long as you can, certain people are going to have a much higher or a much longer rate that they can sprint, right? Yeah. And so... Um, I say like, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be me. Be on the uh, real high, high right, level there. Right. But eventually everybody's going to have a drop-off point. So that varies for, for different people. Um, but there are some things, let's say, for example, your ability to focus. Um, as far as my research has shown, it's just a scientific fact that a human brain can't sustain intense focus for more than 90 to 120 minutes without some kind of release. So if you sit down for your work day and you try to grind out four hours at a time, there's going to be a drop off in your focus at some point in those four hours. Yeah. So uh, what I see from a lot of high performers is they're taking four or five 90 minute, 90 to 100 minute work sessions uh, in a day where it's, you know, full focus. For me, it's earplugs in like I am blocking out everything else. I'm not checking my phone, not checking my social media. I know what my objectives are for the day. Fully focus. And then I'm taking a break where I go wrestle my kids or I step outside, get some sunshine, something like that. And then I'm back into another session. And so it kind of depends on the intensity of the work and, yeah, the capacity of the individual. What about a quote? You know, the quote says, you know, if you do what you're passionate about, you know, work a day in your life, you know, that kind of thing. Like find out what you really, really love doing that you can get paid a fair compensation for yeah. and it doesn't feel like work. Like, yeah. is there something to that or you're like, nah, I don't know. I, I think you can fall off the cliff on either side, you know, yeah. where I think there's some truth in it that people should try to find something that they're good at doing. Yeah. Um, when someone's giving a high, uh, energy into something, but it's not moving the needle very much. Yeah. Like for me, if you asked me to do administration work, I would be really frustrated because I'm putting in a lot of effort, yeah. but I'm seeing very little payoff yeah. for it. So that's yeah. why it's important to have the right people in the right seats, uh, to quote your book there. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I just think uh, most likely in every job, there's just stuff that we don't want to do. Uh, yeah. I certainly do loads of things on a regular basis that I'm like, yeah, I don't like this, but yeah. I try. I think you could find enjoyment in any work. So even if you find yourself in a role that you really don't prefer, I would more so encourage somebody to find, try to find the enjoyment in it and the meaning in it rather than switch jobs, uh, at least initially. Yeah. You know, my generation is the generation that's pursued their passion more than any other generation. And they're also statistically the least unhappy uh, in least, their work. Least unhappy? Or or, sorry, least happy in okay. their, in their okay. role. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So. And why do you think that is? I think... And this is something that you talk about, so I'd like to hear your opinion on it. But I think the biggest payoff in the workplace that I've found is not the paycheck. It's the uh, helping of others. So when you're generous, when you're giving, that's where the most joy is found. Um, You know, I have a faith background. There's a scripture that Jesus tells us to love one another. And he says, I write these things so that your joy may be complete. (laughs) And I do think, you know, or you can quote Tony Robbins, the secret of living is giving. Uh, It's that ability, that sense of when you are doing something and you feel like you're helping somebody else, that's a huge payoff. And I think the more self-centered we get with work, uh, the more we just settle into unhappiness. Yeah, totally. Yeah, wow, that's. I mean, obviously, that's this. I'm agreeing with this one just on the whole. Yeah, yeah. Pur- purpose and meaning, like why are we doing what we're doing? Yes, yeah. is, is very a generation that's coming through right now. They just want to know. It's not like well, it's a job. You sit down, shut up, and do this for the next forty years. Yeah. 
and then you retire. Yep. You know, like, and you retire as fast as you possibly can so you can do things that you really want to do. Yep. Like, wait, but I won't have any health then and my kids won't like me anymore because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, yes. I was never there. You know? Yeah. I was, I was going to be really extreme. Yeah. But, uh, but I think if we can tap into the greater meaning and the purpose behind it, yeah, it's, it, it makes the work you know, and it's called work for a reason, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's like there's work and play. You know, it's great when there's an intersection, but uh, for most people, we still somebody's got to do some of the you know not so sexy jobs out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can tie into purpose in it and think, okay, this is the good that I'm doing, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes the good is not just actually in the work, but it's after the work, mm-hmm. but it's because of that work. You know, where you take some of the profits or you take some time to do service and care for care for people and. Um, I, I think it really does sweeten this thing called work yes. and make it more enjoyable and maybe give a little bit more stamina. Yeah. Like, you, you know, you, it's like when you, your family vacation's coming up, uh, usually, well, this is my experience. If I know I'm going on a family vacation, my hours and effort and productivity actually goes up because mm-hmm. I'm building towards this thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I just got to push through a little bit more so that I can go and shut off, mm-hmm. throw my phone away. Yeah, you know? yeah. I don't want to ha- hit it with a hammer sometimes. But I'm like, like I, I'm, I'm motivated to push hard mm-hmm. to give this extra effort because there's such good about to happen. Like being, yeah. with my, being over, you know, 150% present with my family with zero distractions. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What do, you, uh, what, do you, what do you see on some of those things of people pushing extra hard to, to get – is, is is well let me let me ask it quite a different way is a reason why people are not are getting burned out and not resting because they're chasing um this thing and it might not be a vacation but like as much money as i possibly can or whatever is that is that a a, play, a factor here yeah it's interesting because you know i do a lot of work with executive teams so sometimes i sit with particularly owners you're the owner of the company and um they might work 60, 70, week, 70 hour weeks and they don't feel burnt out. And then they have an employee that's working a 35 hour week that says, ah, I feel burnt out. I need to go home and practice some self care. I hope, hopefully, that employee is not watching the podcast because they're switching off right now. <laughs> well, sorry if I stepped, like, screw you. Sorry if I, I stepped on some toes. I hate him. <laughs> yeah. But I do think people can get burnt out from working too much, but they can also get burnt out just from not um, finding the enjoyment in their work. Um, There's a really interesting study done. They took these children that love to draw, and after they finished a drawing, they started to give them a gold star. And at some point, then they took away the gold star. And what they found is the kids didn't like to draw anymore. Um, so what they essentially did is they moved the dopamine release from the work itself to the reward. And so it's one of the things that I think organizations, especially forward thinking organizations that want to be so incentive based that say, hey, you know, you're going to get this, you know, vacation or whatever it is at the end. There's some value to that because I think we should be working for, um, you know, some sense of, of payoff in the end. Um, but one of my passions is actually helping people to find the meaning in the work or, or the enjoyment in the work itself. And so, like for me right now in entrepreneurship, one of the hardest things I've ever done, you know, and I work with teams, you know, where people will say, why don't you come work for me? I'll pay you five times what you're getting paid right now. And I'm like, no, I'm going to stay in the struggle of, you know, building something from scratch. So difficult, you know, but the reason I'm still doing it is because I've really fallen in love with the process and how much, how hard it is. Like actually how much I'm failing and how much I learned from the failure. Uh, it's, it's changing me as a person. And so I, I love the work. I even love the the hard stuff. I love the stuff that challenges me. And I think if we can help our employees have some measure of autonomy within that, where that's not just follow the script, do this thing, but they, you feel like this is your little place of creativity where you have some God given building of value of meaning of something that helps somebody else. Um, if they can tap into that, it's, I do think vacations on that back end are great, but I also think, today you know can you find enjoyment in your work today wow so much so much in here uh 
number one, I'm like realizing, yeah, I need to stop like trying to reward my kids to do certain little things. Like, you're like and then you get a little bonus. And then yeah. it's like, it's kind of like, then they get to the point where they're like, well, what am I going to get for it? I'm like, I just asked you to take the trash cans out. You know, like, yeah. well, what do I get? Yeah. <laughs> like, you get to eat. You yeah. know, that's what you get to do. No, it's, it's not that bad. But it's like, it, it is funny. <laughs> I can see how we train people yeah. with those dopamine rushes and um, rewards for things which are, would be normal. Like, you know, I, I got recently asked, like, should we should we pay people extra or give people some type of reward for doing servicing, caring for their community? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. Like, let's just hire people who care for their community. Like, what that's what concept. we're going to do. We're going we're gonna, to – let's make sure our team deeply care about their community. And if they don't deeply care about it, that's totally fine. Like, mm -hmm. but they, they got to be people who care. Like, mm -hmm. when they see a need, they go, I want to help versus not my problem. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, well, what if I pay you to help the problem? You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to surround myself with those types of people, which we don't. But um, I, uh, a couple of things. One question is, how do you make sure as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a founder, as somebody who's got this deep passion and a conviction that you have the answer to help companies mm -hmm. solve a problem? How do you make sure you don't fall prey to the same issue that you're going around preaching about? Oh, yeah. I have to eat my own oatmeal, as they say, uh, often where, you know, I'm traveling all over the country. This last month I was in Silicon Valley. I was in Georgia. I was in New Orleans. Again, last night I was in Chicago. I have four kids, five, three, two, and a five-month-old. Do a lot of volunteer work uh, throughout the week. I did a fitness competition this year. Um, so I'm doing a lot. I have a lot of output which means I have to be so strategic on input. So I have to okay. really ma measure of, okay, if this is how much you want to accomplish, like I have a full on action plan for how I'm not going to get burnt out. And so far it's going really well. I don't feel it's a written down plan. Uh, no, it's, it's just okay. in my head. Interesting. <laughs> I um, thought you had that written down. You're an action man. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always tinkering with things, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. but you know, whether it be the rest side of things, the stress side of things, yeah. or the uh the payoff side of things. And probably my wife is more at risk for burnout than I am, um, yeah. with me traveling and whatnot. Yeah. So uh, I think as, you know, uh, a husband I have to be What do you just tell her? Like, take some rest. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I have to be really diligent with my wife, um, to insist at times that she takes rest or, yeah. or does these things. And I think that's, um, you know, I, I was talking with, a, a CEO recently and he said that he had administrative assistant often. They're the ones that they, they're, they love helping people. They take on too much. And, um, <laughs> you know, he said, how are you? She said, doing great. You know? And he said, for real, are you taking on too much? you know, broke down and cried all these things. And he was like, okay, I am taking these things off your plate. He sent an email to the rest of the organization. No one can ask her for all these little favors that you ask her. She's my executive assistant. Like I'm taking, I'm removing things off her plate. So he had to kind of step in as a leader and say, I'm protecting yeah. your time. That's great. Um, so I think as a husband, I do have to do that with my wife, but I also think leaders have to, be really good at managing kind of the energy levels yeah. of the people that we lead. So, ah, uh, that's good. Um, I have a, I have a life coach, um, and, uh, also known as a therapist, but we call him a life coach. <laughs> it sounds less, you know, stigma with it now. Um, and, uh, and he said to me at one point a few years back, he said, wow, you're the least strategic CEO that I work with. And I'm like, what? And, uh, I go, what do you mean? You know, suddenly take offense to that. And he goes, like you have no strategy for rest. Mm. And I'm like, well, I, you know, and I've sort of come back and, um, and he goes, he goes, so, so walk me through your strategy of rest. And I was like, and he said, that's not a strategy. Mm. Uh, and he goes, when you, all you have a business plan, a business strategy, where you want to go the next three years and five years and 10 years, <clears throat> here's the map. You've got it all laid out and here are the values and here's the structure. Here's this. And he goes, but you don't have any strategy for rest. Uh, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I see what you're saying. And he goes, if you're going to go that distance and if you're going to go that far and you've got a plan to get there, you better have worked out how you're going to get refreshment, recoup, you know, downtime, 
Like what, what refreshes your own physical body, your own soul? Like what are you doing to invest in that? Mm -hmm. um, that's not driven by, you know, I got to keep going. I got to hit my goal faster because I mm. like crushing goals. And he's like, you'd have no rest goal. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, how, isn't that selfish? And he goes, like, what? And he goes, selfish. He goes, it's not about selfish. He goes, it's about self-care. Mm. Like, you, he goes, is self-care selfish? He's like, it's like sticking the face mask on, you know, the planes, <laughs> planes yeah. losing oxygen. You get to stick some oxygen in your, in your own face first mm -hmm. before you try and help others. And I'm like, okay. I go, but how do I say I'm going to go and take care of myself? And he goes, he goes try it and your, and your family will thank you. Yep. Um, try it. They'll thank you because you'll be more present. But try it consistently and they'll thank you because um you are like engaged more with them in your in your times together and mm. i'm like wow okay so i started practicing it and it's been helpful yeah um i'm not yeah. i'm I'm not writing a book on on burnout or rest or you know yeah. dealing with workplace stress but it is something of a, of a journey so are you going to write a book yeah, maybe it's someday. Um, so I'm definitely in the research stage right now. I feel like I'm still learning so much. Um, it's one of the reasons I love speaking with these organizations. I ask, I try to ask as many questions as, yeah. as they ask me. Um, so I'm learning loads right now. Um, I do think from a straight performance standpoint, um, you know, there was a, a study done in the military where they had group A and group B, these marksmen, where they said, group A, we want you to shoot at the target continuously, no breaks. And group B, we want you to shoot at the target, but take strategic breaks. Yeah. And day one, group A hit the target more often. Uh, but by day two, the group that was taking breaks overtook <laughs> group A. And by day three, group B was dominating group A. Just because as the fatigue set in, group A just began missing the target more. And yeah. so the group that was continuously uh, working uh, was actually less productive. So I think that's one of the reasons that I got into kind of the mental health or self-care, burnout, all these words that honestly I have an aversion to. Yeah. If someone says self-care, I feel like I want to slap them. Yeah, I, That's just like my natural reaction as a, a worker. Um, but <laughs> um so many people, I think, in this industry are like, let's take care of our people. And I'm like, that's great. I do think we should take care of our people. But I think I was coming at it from more of a results mindset of yeah. like, how do we move the needle? And right. turns out taking care of ourselves and our people actually moves the needle as well. And so yeah. it's kind of this fantastic uh, revelation for me of like, oh, we can take care of our people. And that will also grow the business. Like yep. these things aren't opposed to one another. That's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking as a kind of my business owner hat on going like, how do you how do you rhythmically put rest in for everybody with it? Anyway, that's another put some thought into that. But uh, um, I remember sitting at um, I was at elementary graduation, which is funny, elementary school graduation, end of year, and uh, one of my kids and the the kind of keynote was one of the one of the elementary school kids standing up and giving the school address. And he started talking about the uh, the old classic story of you know two people having a, um, a log chopping contest of tree chopping contest and uh, you know they both go at it really, really hard and then one of them and after five minutes sits down and starts sharpening his mm -hmm. his axe and and then he goes again the other guy's like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna take the lead I'm gonna take the lead he's sitting down sharpening his axe but the classic story of yep. you've got to sharpen the saw or sharpen the axe because it makes you a heck of a lot more you know effective at doing what you're doing but I'm like talking to these, <laughs> seeing these little like kids talking about sharpening the saw in their life and how we need to take rest I'm like what you know like <laughs> from what you know like life's so easy yeah. but I, I was i came away you know took my kind of like the mocking like yeah it's so cute laughing thing combine that with somebody telling me you're the least strategic ceo yeah because you don't sharpen the saw i'm like oh i see this there's an interesting a generation coming through we had a podcast guest um recently talking all about um well <laughs> They just kept bringing up this whole topic of of rest and refreshment and burnout and how it ties to just the sense of belonging in the in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I shared about how one of our, our team members said in front of the whole company, their sort of highlight of the week was one of their employee, one of their team members, like right before a meeting, they, the 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 director said, "I'm sorry to one of their direct reports. I can't show up. I'm I'm breaking down. I'm losing it." 
Mm. Uh, can you cover for me? Can you cover with this client meeting? And just that rawness and the sense of, like to be able to say that, mm. like I need help or I need to sharpen the saw, even though this is an inconvenience to other people, I need to do it. Otherwise I'm not going to make it. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, 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 an aspirational place to get to in the company where everyone feels that they don't have to kind of put on this front of like, I'm, I'm, I'm trucking ahead. I'm doing it, you know? Yeah. Um, and you know, everyone's, I, mean, the, the, I think probably the dynamic of everyone being different mm -hmm. is everyone wiring different. Like some people need more rep, like we talked about in the company at tight. It's like, Hey, if you need two weeks, you know, two full weeks off a year, um, for rest to do that. If you need seven, do that, mm -hmm. like figure out what you need and, and work out how you're going to get it in there. Yeah. Uh, according to you, everyone's got their clear performance objectives. So they know they've got to hit their stuff done. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's probably easier said than done. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, figure it out. You know? So then we're like now trying to, Hey, can we, can everyone log their stuff? Tell us what you need at the beginning of the year so that we can not just hold you accountable on rest, but encourage you. You've got that rest thing. Don't kick it off. Don't push it off. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what are some of the changes that you've made since uh, you said you've been prioritizing self-care a bit more? <laughs> when you say you're not working, don't work. If you say you're on vacation, don't go, I'm on my vacation, but you can reach out to me. Mm, yeah. Because I think a lot of leaders with direct reports, they want to show themselves as available and present because all the stats show having an available present boss or a leader or a manager or a coach. I can never get hold of them. They're so busy. Mm -hmm. So then they go on vacation or time off or – I'm on a, a whatever it is you, you're not working mm -hmm. or you're busy, but to go, I can multitask. Mm -hmm. You know, I do this thing. I'm like, oh, I'm in meetings all day today, but text me because I can multitask mm -hmm. as long as my eyes are on the Zoom looking like I'm on Zoom. You know, yeah. so we, we tell this story <laughs> like, I'm not present. Yeah. What, what did I just say to them? I'm like, I do the same thing to you when I'm in a meeting. Like, people text me and I'm like, I'm always multitasking. I can take a pride in yeah. overachieving. Yeah. Like, that's got to stop. Like, yeah. I don't, I'm even saying like that's got to stop. Do I? I don't know if I even believe that statement. Yeah, Is yeah. it like I'm? I'm a very productive person. I'm doing lots of things at lots of times. Yeah, multiple things. So when I'm on vacation or when, let me do this, when I'm resting, when I'm going for a walk early in the morning, you know, centering myself and getting myself clear-minded, mm -hmm. meditating or whatever. You know, I'm um, finding my strength mm -hmm. for the day, for the journey, or finding my strength in a longer period for you know, vacation or rest. Like, do I welcome people just to come and like invade that? Mm -hmm. Or do I actually put the boundaries up and say no? Yeah. Because until I say no, uh, anyone who's in the company, direct mm -hmm. reports or what they see, they're going to go, that's just what you do. Mm -hmm. If you're on vacation, you, you got to show people that you're available. Yeah. If I don't lead by example in it, that's everybody it. else in the company is going to feel, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Jonathan, yeah is available all the time. Yeah. Like, so I, I'm putting my foot down on certain things like that. Like we have, um, uh, one of our, um, my business partners, when we started the company, we said, okay, after X amount of years, um, each of us agree to take a solid month off where you disconnect. You, you don't take a laptop. There is zero company communication, even mm. between one another, wow. like how things are going. Um, few things. One is, um, and it was a whole month, you know, and one is it's good for you to get, you know, refueled and fill the canteen, et cetera, mm -hmm. for, for the journey ahead. But also we've got to create companies or organizations where everything's not dependent upon us. Yeah. Yep. Like it's not good leadership or development of people. If every decision has to go through somebody, I don't like it. That's just not, I'm not really helping other people grow. Like, mm -hmm. um, what's the, I know I'm not allowed to say hit by a bus strategy anymore because that's, you know, so we say win the lottery. You know, if somebody won the lottery yeah. and they weren't here tomorrow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, what are you going to do? Have you, have you created a culture where people are empowered to make decisions when you're not available? Yeah. Or when you're off on vacation or whatever, you're like, oh, they're on vacation, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Like, well, maybe we should really, really look at that. So mm -hmm. there's one thing. Um, yeah, I think setting setting boundaries and sticking to them. And you, well, for me, I'm better in some seasons than others. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, just just saying I'm off or I'm doing something personal mm -hmm. or, um, and blocking on my calendar and not and not not sacrificing that because mm -hmm. at what cost am I sacrificing? And I think probably one of the biggest costs is 
burnout through the organization because everybody yeah. gets the message. You're supposed to be available when you're at your kids game. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. And a book that I read cover to cover years back uh, called Maverick by Ricardo Semler, South American guy, entrepreneur, mega, like owns all kinds of businesses and big business with thousands of employees. Um, he was looking at this whole concept of how people work really, really hard to try and get as much money as they possibly can to retire early to do things. And he was the one who said, you know, by that point, you don't have your health mm -hmm. and your family you know, don't want to be around you yeah. um, because you were never present. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes, so he started looking at his own life saying, oh, I'm going to create bucket my, my own bucket list of what I want to do when I'm all, when I'm when I'm successful enough to be able to free myself up to do it. And he goes, all right, now I'm going to start living my life with bucket list days. And so he put a bucket list day every week mm. in his schedule. Yeah. And it was time that he didn't do anything else. He just did his bucket list stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it was one of those things where I'm like, wow, that sounds really crazy. You know, like if <laughs> I was an employee of another company, I'm like, can you just go to my boss? Like, I'm going to have a bucket list day. You know, like yeah. they'd look at me like, well, you're insane. So um, oh, I'm not paying for that, you yeah. know, but <laughs> But it's, I think it probably goes to some of this thing of like the sharpening the saw and, you know, yes, you, sh you could do that on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Fair point. But how do we help encourage people to do that? And do we give them finances to do this? Do we give them the, the time to do it? Do we give, and I'm like, uh, some of these things I can be like really like pie in the sky about, but he actually created his company doing that. He said, people will exchange rather than earning the money to do it later when they don't have the, the mm -hmm. time left or the health, let's give it back and we'll, we'll sell those days to them now. Mm-hmm. And so they were buying back time mm. when they have life and energy and health to do the things on their bucket list. It's a, it's a, mm. one of those kind of like uh, very challenging and inspiring, uh, which I like those type of people, um, uh, books around how do you look at time and work and energy and rest mm -hmm. and bucket list and can people exchange? So it's it, it was that book that actually helped me with the time off concept that people mm -hmm. can have flexible time off. Mm -hmm. If they want to work more, they get to share in the profits that they're generating. If they want to work less and take more time off, they can as well. Yeah. So that's kind of how we created it, Titus. And it we realize though there is a dr there is an addictive drug in productivity in our culture here in the yeah. states, and especially if you're going to pay me more money to do it. Yeah. Um. We we used to have this thing of like everyone has a goal. Once you hit your goal, you're you're done. Mm -hmm. Like you can keep working if you want. And we had somebody hit their goal by October something for the whole year, and they're like, I'm not actually incentivized to work from here on out. They worked yeah. you know, a 60 hour work week, and uh, and so they they stopped working. They didn't work the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And it was as a business owner, I'm like, what is happening? You know, like mm -hmm. they're just not working for three months, you know, right, like, right. but they pay, we pay them a salary and right. they were like, yeah, peace out. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, doing this kind of like, isn't that great? You know? Like, yeah, um, yeah. And I did think, you know, it was like one of those kind of mesmerizing moments. Like this is really great. I think, but if everyone did it, it'd be like a disaster, you know? Yeah. So then we said, okay, we'll give them, if you keep working, we'll give you a, a bigger piece of the pie, you sure. know, any profits they generate. Um, but that is an addictive drug yeah. um, in a culture where it's quite um, com a, a national culture and a company culture is quite, um, you can get all of the levers go really, really well to create the biggest problem that you're trying to tag. Yeah. And I think we, I mean, we've had a tendency at Titus to do that, to create this machine that people grow, grow, grow. And we say it's in our growth, it's in our DNA, it's in our entrepreneurial spirits. These, and so we celebrate that mm -hmm. versus a number of uh, years back, somebody said, hey, you don't make a big deal about everybody when they hit 100%. You're just celebrating the 150 percenters. Mm. I'm like, oh, yeah. Mm. Like, I worked my tail off to hit 100%. Mm -hmm. And then I was strategic and I invested the rest of my time in the things that were really important outside of work mm -hmm. so that I can be a hundred percent inside work. And we're like, mm -hmm. Oh, we got to celebrate that too. So yeah, we're trying, we're trying to, I mean, I'm constantly, I'm like, like you, I'm, like, I'm a constant learner, seeing how the best ways of doing things. Yeah. Observation, I'm trying to listen to the people, but yeah. it is sometimes, you know, people are not always really honest with you. Yeah. Um, because they don't know what they can and can't say without getting, you know, being seen as a non-company yeah. driver. Yeah. I don't want people to think I'm not a entrepreneurial or not a yeah. high-performing individual. Yeah. So yeah. How do we create environments where people can go? Like, I'm I'm just tired. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of a paradox. I mean, um, it's a challenge because certainly we want to celebrate great work and great performance. Um, but, you know, certainly when I was doing life insurance the whole time, you know, on my way to burnout, people were like, yeah, he's doing it. He's breaking all these records, you know, so and it was you like, you need to buy you some life insurance. <laughs> it's like you can buy your own. Right, right. And it's like, that's kind of the worst news is I only worked there for six months. So it was like, what? they hired me, they trained me and I quit all within a six month period of time. And, and you crushed it. Like top yeah, performer. Right. Yeah. And so it was this like, the worst case scenario for both of us, you know, yeah. like for the CEO to say, I invested all this time training you and now I'm just starting to see you crush it and now you're quitting. It's horrible for him. Yeah. But the whole time he was clapping for me on my way up to high performance, you know? So it's one of those weird things of like, um, yeah, we celebrate when somebody's crushing it, but you know, we have to make sure that they're not, what are the, what's the cost, you know, yeah. of, okay, Caleb's selling all these policies. What is he trading for that success? And for me, it was my health and my relationships, which is pretty common for people. And so sure. when people get to a place where they say, my job is killing me, that's when they quit. Cause it's a survival mechanism where they mm -hmm. say, okay, this job is now taking over my life. So hard stop. And mm -hmm. so, okay, how do we get people to where they're not, you know, just on or off, but say, let's pace ourselves a little bit. Let's make it sustainable. And so I don't know that I've necessarily figured out the implementation side of these things. Again, every industry is different yeah. and you're always tinkering with different things. But, uh, I do think, people need to prioritize rest. And if it doesn't yeah. start with the leadership, then you have no chance. Cause you could say, Caleb, come in, do this wellness program with us, whatever. And then if you're sending out emails and what at one in the morning and like setting that standard for people, they're like, Oh, I should probably be working at one in the morning. You know, my right. boss is working at one in the morning. I that just do a delayed send to go at one in the morning, <laughs> but I send it like four in the afternoon yeah, to impress people. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. I'm that's... not saying I've never done that. Uh, <laughs> back in a company that really, like, yeah, decade ago, you know, yeah, the, the, I, I saw it all around. I'm like, flipping heck, why? You know, it, it was humorous to me. I'm like, yeah. why are people working at eleven, twelve, one in the morning? Yeah, and I'm like, so um, I, 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 <laughs> there was one day I all of my emails through the whole day. I put a delayed send to go. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Just, to be, just to like you know. They didn't hear from me all day, and then suddenly all these emails at midnight. Yeah, I was fast asleep. It was yeah. really funny. I just wanted to see what would happen. Like, yeah. are they? Is it like what, what's going on? Was it like, are you okay? Why were you working in the night? Or is it like, wow, you're crushing it? Yeah, burning the burning the candle, huh? And that was the response. And I was like, I'm out. I, this is I can't do this. Yeah, is that celebrated? You know, and I was doing it to be take a jab at the yeah. the big machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've had so many CEOs sit across the table from me, you know, telling me that they're wearing a $40,000 watch. And I'm like, what's your marriage life like? And they're like, oh, I've been married six times, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, you think it's really impressive. You yeah. know, you've had success in one area of your life, but I think we have to redefine success, you know? And yeah. so it's like, okay, are people actually finding success in multiple areas of their life? And so, yeah. Um, one of the things I've done as well is, you know, I love studying billionaires. Um, it's really, you know, interesting to me. That's why you sitting here with me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, I look at someone like Jeff Bezos and it's like, he's not making more money than me because he works longer, harder. You know, he's making more money than me because he knows more than me. He understands leverage. You know, he's, yeah. he's, um, with the quality of his mind is how he's making more money. It's not yeah. at some point longer, harder doesn't equal more dollars, you know, right. smarter yeah. equals more dollars. And so if I can say, well, what if I condense my time? What if I'm only working five or six hour days, but they're intensely focused five or six hour days. And I'm also prioritizing other things. Can I find, um, you know, can I get smarter even if I'm working in condensed time? And oftentimes you can. So, um, many billionaires would say that uh, the se secret to success, I don't know if you've heard the famous story with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, uh -uh. where they said in one word, write down the secret of success. They hadn't talked to each other about it. They wrote it down on a piece of paper so they couldn't confer with each other. Yeah. They wrote down the same exact word. That word was focus. They said, you know, successful people are focused. Ultra successful people say no to almost everything. Yeah. And so for me, if I say, okay, here's my goals that I want to accomplish, my default is not 
okay, the way I get there is super high quantity. It's, mm-hmm. I want to get there by super high quality decisions. And so yeah. can I get there by making really high quality decisions? And the only way I can make really high quality decisions is if I'm not physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually exhausted. Yeah. So I prioritize. I'm when I get to Monday morning, it's like the Super Bowl for me, where I'm like, I've been prepping all weekend. I've been bored out of my mind, you know, <laughs> all weekend resting. Let's but hope now that we don't listen to this, well, I mean, <laughs> there's times where I, I have a work project that I'm <laughs> yeah. so excited about, and I'm like, I'm pushing it off till Monday. Yeah. But it's like I rested, and it's like I'm gearing up, so that way when I hit it on Monday morning, yeah. I'm just like, boom, let out of the gates. I'm working hard yeah. because I've prioritized rest, and it's it's the way athletes function for sure this is great um yeah. and so i think that's that's how we can help our teams as well okay tell me you're putting together some kind of a system that people can follow for this yeah so every time i speak people are like what's your implementation program and i am really excited because we have i've finally i've pulled together some other uh people in this space and we have actually put together a three-month well wellness program right now it's just for executive teams because again i believe if yeah. leadership don't get it then it doesn't matter yeah um, but we start with an assessment so a big assessment on okay of yeah. those big three things where are you at it's something that they can then take to their teams and just i think the first point is really Really just understanding where your people are. So let's yeah. do a big assessment and and see, okay, here's the main areas for improvement within our organization. Then we'll do some some coaching and training, but then also uh, how do we build this into our culture? And yeah. sometimes it's small changes. I did this, uh, actually the first organization I did this with, I talked to two of the younger guys. It was a data consulting organization. I said, what's your day look like outside of work? They stare at a computer all day at work. They go home, they start playing video games at about five or six at night. They play till three or four every single morning. And they start work at seven or eight the next morning. Both of what? them. I said, you sleep four hours a night. I said, are you being, are you exaggerating? You actually sleep four hours a night. They're like, yeah, pretty much four hours a night. And what are the quality of that sleep when you're like, oh, 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 you know, w- so wired said, crazy. So I said, you stare at a screen for eight hours. And then the way that you rest and recover is to stare at a screen for another eight hours and you don't sleep. So I'm like, yeah, let's change that one thing. And the owner of the company called me up. He's like, man, we loved having you into our company. Our guys are so much less tired, distracted, all these different things, because you actually will rest. That's the thing that people don't yeah. understand is that if you don't prioritize rest, you're going to start using social media or something throughout your day. Yeah. You're always, it's like a need. It's like drinking yeah. water. You yeah. are at some point going to rest. So we don't want to blend our work and our rest. Let's rest really hard when we're resting. Let's work really hard when we're working. Let's create clear boundaries and let's optimize both. Oh, I like this stuff. Okay, so um, talk me through this. If I go, number one, I want to have you in our company. Uh, What does that look like? An engagement look like as a speaking gig or whatever. Um, Another one is like, how do do the people listening right now, they go, I like what I'm hearing. I want to get Caleb in. What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, the main things I'm doing right now is a keynote. So like an hour long keynote uh, for those are big company meetings, typically um, a workshop that I've done mostly with executive teams or sales teams is kind of my my the organizations I know best or the, you know, yeah. departments I know best, I should say. Uh, and then this wellness program, which is, is three months. Um, so, yeah, they can. Uh, I'm on all the social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. I check them all. Um, like all the time, you're always on them. I'm in the always evenings, on them <laughs> at one in the morning. Just scrolling. <laughs> just, you're there ready for the next uh, thing. Yeah. I DM mean, me night or day. Yeah. I mean, my email is just info at calebspitler.com. Um, if you want, uh, I, for one year, I actually primarily studied just sleep just because I was so interested on it. Uh, so I took almost a full year to just study sleep. Um, so I put all the best sleep hacks into a PDF. Uh, And if people want that, you can just text sleep to 33777. And it'll automatically text you out that PDF. It's a year's worth of research research in one PDF. And because it's not just the quantity of sleep, there's a lot of things you can do to increase your quality of sleep. So you wake up more refreshed. Say the name. Okay, text the word sleep. Yep. To what number? 33777. 33777. 
Yep. You'll get that, that PDF. My goal, my initial goal, I was going to put it into a digital course and then sell it, but now I've kind of moved on from some of that. So it was I too just, much hard work. Exactly. You, you wanted to keep resting. Yeah. Digital course too. People have to listen all the way through it. I was like, I could probably put this together in one PDF that people could just Focus. implement. <laughs> exactly. So you know the stuff. No, yeah. I love that. It's great. So, uh, info at Caleb Spittler, assuming Caleb Spittler is a web website as well. Yeah. Caleb Spittler.com. Okay, cool. That's great. Well, it's so cool to have you here. And uh, it's cool to hear what you're doing, what you're focusing on right now. And I'm sold. I'm in. Uh, I, I, I get excited about a lot of things, but um, I'm really intrigued now the impact of optimization. We talk about talent optimization a lot mm -hmm. of Titus. How do you optimize your talent? Um, and it's not just how you get stuff out of your t people, but how do you give to yeah. your people that makes a real lasting impact in their lives. And I really genuinely believe the investment in our people to make them healthy and whole mm -hmm. um, in all aspects of their life. If we, if we put, provide that or offer it to our people, not everyone wants it. We put, we offer things in our company to people and they're like, I don't want any of that stuff. I don't want that. I'm like, all right, well, you don't have to take it then. Yeah. It's fine. But for some people they do and they realize the value in it. Um, so I love what you're doing. And I think it's a, uh, um, totally cheering, cheering uh, you on and the success of this. And I know you're going to have an impact on some of our clients as well. So thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate it, Jonathan. You're such an inspiration to me as well. And uh, I think Titus does some of this stuff better than almost any company I know. So oh, keep on, doing man. what you're doing. Thanks so, a lot. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah.